Section 16 of The Critique of Practical Reason by Immanuel Kant, translated by Thomas Kingsmill Abbott. First part. Elements of Pure Practical Reason, Book 2, Dialectic of Pure Practical Reason, Chapter 2, Of the Dialectic of Pure Reason in Defining the Conception of the Summum Bonum. 6. Of the Postulates of Pure Practical Reason Generally. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. They all proceed from the principle of morality, which is not a postulate, but a law, by which reason determines the will directly, which will, because it is so determined as a pure will, requires these necessary conditions of obedience to its precept. These postulates are not theoretical dogmas, but suppositions practically necessary. While then they do not extend our speculative knowledge, they give objective reality to the ideas of speculative reason in general, by means of their reference to what is practical, and give it a right to concepts, the possibility even of which it could not otherwise venture to affirm. These postulates are those of immortality, freedom positively considered, as the causality of a being so far as he belongs to the intelligible world, and the existence of God. The first results from the practically necessary condition of a duration adequate to the complete fulfilment of the moral law, the second from the necessary supposition of independence of the sensible world, and of the faculty of determining one's will according to the law of an intelligible world, that is, of freedom, the third from the necessary condition of the existence of the summum bonum in such an intelligible world, by the supposition of the supreme independent good, that is, the existence of God. Thus the fact that respect for the moral law necessarily makes the summum bonum an object of our endeavours, and the supposition thence resulting of its objective reality, lead through the postulates of practical reason, to conceptions which speculate reason might indeed present as problems, but could never solve. Thus it leads, 1. To that one in the solution of which the latter could do nothing but commit paralogisms, namely that of immortality, because it could not lay hold of the character of permanence, by which to complete the psychological conception of an ultimate subject necessarily ascribed to the soul in self-consciousness, so as to make it the real conception of a substance, a character which practical reason furnishes by the postulate of a duration required for accordance with the moral law in the summum bonum, which is the whole end of practical reason. 2. It leads to that of which speculative reason contained nothing but antinomy, the solution of which it could only found on a notion problematically conceivable indeed, but whose objective reality it could not prove or determine, namely, the cosmological idea of an intelligible world, and the consciousness of our existence in it, by means of the postulate of freedom, the reality of which it lays down by virtue of the moral law, and with it likewise the law of an intelligible world, to which speculative reason could only point, but could not define its conception. 3. What speculative reason was able to think, but was obliged to leave undetermined, as a mere transcendental ideal, viz., the theological conception of the first being. To this it gives significance, in a practical view, that is, as a condition of the possibility of the object of a will determined by that law, namely, as the supreme principle of the summum bonum in an intelligible world by means of moral legislation in it invested with sovereign power. Is our knowledge, however, actually extended in this way by pure practical reason, and is that imminent in practical reason which for the speculative was only transcendent? Certainly, but only in a practical point of view. For we do not thereby take knowledge of the nature of our souls, 
nor of the intelligible world, nor of the Supreme Being, with respect to what they are in themselves, but we have merely combined the conceptions of them in the practical concept of the summum bonum as the object of our will, and this altogether a priori, but only by means of the moral law, and merely in reference to it, in respect of the object which it commands. But how freedom is possible, and how we are to conceive this kind of causality, theoretically and positively, is not thereby discovered, but only that there is such a causality is postulated by the moral law and in its behoof. It is the same with the remaining ideas, the possibility of which no human intelligence will ever fathom, but the truth of which, on the other hand, no sophistry will ever wrest from the conviction even of the commonest man. 7. How is it possible to conceive an extension of pure reason in a practical point of view, without its knowledge as speculative being enlarged at the same time? In order not to be too abstract, we will answer this question at once, in its application to the present case. In order to extend a pure cognition practically, there must be an a priori purpose given, that is, an end as object, of the will, which independently of all theological principle is presented as practically necessary by an imperative which determines the will directly, a categorical imperative, and in this case that is the summum bonum. This, however, is not possible without presupposing three theoretical conceptions, for which, because they are mere conceptions of pure reason, no corresponding intuition can be found, nor consequently by the path of theory any objective reality, namely, freedom, immortality, and God. Thus, by the practical law which commands the existence of the highest good possible in a world, the possibility of those objects of pure speculative reason is postulated, and the objective reality which the latter could not assure them. By this the theoretical knowledge of pure reason does indeed obtain an accession, but it consists only in this, that those concepts which otherwise it had to look upon as problematical, merely thinkable, concepts, are now shown assertorially to be such as actually have objects, because practical reason indispensably requires their existence for the possibility of its object, the summum bonum, which practically is absolutely necessary, and this justifies theoretical reason in assuming them. But this extension of theoretical reason is no extension of speculative, that is, we cannot make any positive use of it in a theoretical point of view. For as nothing is accomplished in this by practical reason, further than that these concepts are real and actually have their possible objects, and nothing in the way of intuition of them is given thereby, which indeed could not be demanded, hence the admission of this reality does not render any synthetical proposition possible. Consequently this discovery does not in the least help us to extend this knowledge of ours in a speculative point of view, although it does in respect of the practical employment of pure reason. The above three ideas of speculative reason are still in themselves not cognitions. They are, however, transcendent thoughts, in which there is nothing impossible. Now, by help of an apodeictic practical law, being necessary conditions of that which it commands to be made an object, they acquire objective reality, that is, we learn from it that they have objects, without being able to point out how the conception of them is related to an object, and this, too, is still not a cognition of these objects, for we cannot thereby form any synthetical judgment about them, nor determine their application theoretically. Consequently, we can make no theoretical rational use of them at all, in which use all speculative knowledge of reason consists. Nevertheless, the theoretical knowledge, not indeed of these objects, but of reason generally, is so far enlarged by this, that by the practical postulates objects were given to those ideas a merely problematical thought having by this means first acquired objective reality. 
There is therefore no extension of the knowledge of given supersensible objects, but an extension of theoretical reason, and of its knowledge in respect of the supersensible generally, inasmuch as it is compelled to admit that there are such objects, although it is not able to define them more closely, so as itself to extend this knowledge of the objects, which have now been given it on practical grounds, and only for practical use. For this accession, then, pure theoretical reason, for which all those ideas are transcendent and without object, has simply to thank its practical faculty. In this they become imminent and constitutive, being the source of the possibility of realizing the necessary object of pure practical reason, the summum bonum. Whereas apart from this they are transcendent, and merely regulative principles of speculative reason, which do not require it to assume a new object beyond experience, but only to bring its use in experience nearer to completeness. But when once reason is in possession of this accession, it will go to work with these ideas as speculative reason, properly only to assure the certainty of its practical use, in a negative manner, that is, not extending but clearing up its knowledge, so as on one side to keep off anthropomorphism, as the source of superstition, or seeming extension of these conceptions by supposed experience, and on the other side fanaticism, which promises the same by means of supersensible intuition or feelings of the like kind. All these are hindrances to the practical use of pure reason, so that the removal of them may certainly be considered an extension of our knowledge, in a practical point of view, without contradicting the admission that for speculative purposes reason has not in the least gained by this. Every employment of reason in respect of an object requires pure concepts of the understanding, categories, without which no object can be conceived. These can be applied to the theoretical employment of reason, i.e. to that kind of knowledge, only in case an intuition, which is always sensible, is taken as a basis, and therefore merely in order to conceive by means of them an object of possible experience. Now here, what have to be thought by means of the categories in order to be known are ideas of reason, which cannot be given in any experience. Only we are not here concerned with the theoretical knowledge of the objects of these ideas, but only with this, whether they have objects at all. This reality is supplied by pure practical reason, and theoretical reason has nothing further to do in this but to think those objects by means of categories. This, as we have elsewhere clearly shown, can be done well enough without needing any intuition, either sensible or supersensible, because the categories have their seat and origin in the pure understanding, simply as the faculty of thought, before and independently of any intuition, and they always only signify an object in general, no matter what way it may be given to us. Now, when the categories are to be applied to these ideas, it is not possible to give them any object in intuition, but that such an object actually exists, and consequently that the category is a mere form of thought, is here not empty, but has significance. This is sufficiently assured them by an object which practical reason presents beyond doubt in the concept of the summum bonum. The reality of the conceptions which are required for the possibility of the summum bonum, without, however, effecting by this accession the least extension of our knowledge on theoretical principles. When these ideas of God, of an intelligible world, the kingdom of God, and of immortality are further determined by predicates taken from our own nature, we must not regard this determination as a sensualizing of those pure rational ideas, anthropomorphism, nor as a transcendent knowledge of supersensible objects. For these predicates are no others than understanding and will, considered too in the relation to each other in which they must be conceived in the moral law, and therefore only so far as a pure practical use is made of them. As to all the rest that belongs to these conceptions psychologically, that is, so far as we observe these faculties of ours empirically in their exercise, 
e.g., that the understanding of man is discursive, and its notions therefore not intuitions but thoughts, these that follow one another in time, that his will has its satisfaction always dependent on the existence of its object, etc., which cannot be the case in the Supreme Being. From all this we abstract in that case, and then there remains of the notions by which we conceive a pure intelligence nothing more than just what is required for the possibility of conceiving a moral law. There is then a knowledge of God indeed, but only for practical purposes, and, if we attempt to extend it to a theoretical knowledge, we find an understanding that has intuitions, not thoughts, a will that is directed to objects on the existence of which its satisfaction does not in the least depend. Not to mention the transcendental predicates, as, for example, a magnitude of existence, that is duration, which, however, is not in time, the only possible means we have of conceiving existence as magnitude. Now these are all attributes of which we can form no conception that would help to the knowledge of the object, and we learn from this that they can never be used for a theory of supersensible beings, so that on this side they are quite incapable of being the foundation of a speculative knowledge, and their use is limited simply to the practice of the moral law. This last is so obvious, and can be proved so clearly by fact, that we may confidently challenge all pretended natural theologians, a singular name, to specify, over and above the merely ontological predicates, one single attribute, whether of the understanding or of the will, determining this object of theirs, of which we could not show incontrovertibly that, if we abstract from it everything anthropomorphic, nothing would remain to us but the mere word, without our being able to connect with it the smallest notion by which we could hope for an extension of theoretical knowledge. But as to the practical, there still remains to us the attributes of understanding and will, the conception of a relation to which objective reality is given by the practical law, which determines a priori precisely this relation of the understanding to the will. When once this is done, then reality is given to the conception of the object of a will morally determined, the conception of the summum bonum, and with it to the conditions of its possibility, the ideas of God, freedom, and immortality, but always only relatively to the practice of the moral law, and not for any speculative purpose. Learning is properly only the whole content of the historical sciences, Consequently, it is only the teacher of revealed theology that can be called a learned theologian. If, however, we choose to call a man learned, who is in possession of the rational sciences, mathematics and philosophy, although even this would be contrary to the signification of the word, which always counts as learning only that which one must be learned, and which, therefore, he cannot discover by himself by reason." Even in that case the philosopher would make too poor a figure with his knowledge of God as a positive science, to let himself be called on that account a learned man. According to these remarks it is now easy to find the answer to the weighty question whether the notion of God is one belonging to physics, and therefore also to metaphysics, which contains the pure a priori principles of the former in their universal import, or to morals. If we have recourse to God as the author of all things, in order to explain the arrangements of nature or its changes, this is at least not a physical explanation, and is a complete confession that our philosophy has come to an end, since we are obliged to assume something of which in itself we have otherwise no conception, in order to be able to frame a conception of the possibility of what we see before our eyes. Metaphysics, however, cannot enable us to attain by certain inference from the knowledge of this world to the conception of God and to the proof of his existence, for this reason, that in order to say that this world could be produced only by a God, according to the conception implied by this word, we should know this world as the most perfect whole possible, and for this purpose should also know all possible worlds, in order to be able to compare them with this. In other words, we should be omniscient. 
It is absolutely impossible, however, to know the existence of this being from mere concepts, because every existential proposition, that is, every proposition that affirms the existence of a being of which I frame a concept, is a synthetic proposition, that is, one by which I go beyond that conception and affirm of it more than was thought in the conception itself, namely, that this concept in the understanding has an object corresponding to it outside the understanding, and this it is obviously impossible to elicit by any reasoning. There remains, therefore, only one single process possible for reason to attain this knowledge, namely, to start from the supreme principle of its pure practical use, which in every case is directed simply to the existence of something as a consequence of reason, and thus determine its object. Then its inevitable problem, namely, the necessary direction of the will to the summum bonum, discovers to us not only the necessity of assuming such a first being in reference to the possibility of this good in the world, but, what is most remarkable, something which reason in its progress on the path of physical nature altogether failed to find, namely, an accurately defined conception of this first being. As we can know only a small part of this world, and can still less compare it with all possible worlds, we may indeed, from its order, design, and greatness, infer a wise, good, powerful, etc., author of it, but not that he is all-wise, all-good, all-powerful, etc. It may indeed very well be granted that we should be justified in supplying this inevitable defect by a legitimate and reasonable hypothesis, namely, that when wisdom, goodness, etc., are displayed in all the parts that offer themselves to our nearer knowledge, it is just the same in all the rest, and that it would therefore be reasonable to ascribe all possible perfections to the author of the world, but these are not strict logical inferences in which we can pride ourselves on our insight, but only permitted conclusions in which we may be indulged, and which require further recommendation before we can make use of them. On the path of empirical inquiry, then, physics, the conception of God remains always a conception of the perfection of the first being, not accurately enough determined to be held adequate to the conception of deity. With metaphysic in its transcendental part, nothing whatever can be accomplished. When I now try to test this conception by reference to the object of practical reason, I find that the moral principle admits as possible only the conception of an author of the world, possessed of the highest perfection. He must be omniscient, in order to know my conduct up to the inmost root of my mental state in all possible cases, and into all future time. Omnipotent, in order to allot to it its fitting consequences. Similarly, he must be omnipresent, eternal, etc., Thus the moral law, by means of the conception of the summum bonum, as the object of a pure practical reason, determines the concept of the first being as the supreme being, a thing which the physical, and in its higher development the metaphysical, in other words, the whole speculative course of reason, was unable to effect. The conception of God, then, is one that belongs originally not to physics, i.e. to speculative reason, but to morals. The same may be said of the other conceptions of reason of which we have treated above as postulates of it in its practical use. In the history of Grecian philosophy we find no distinct traces of a pure rational theology earlier than Anaxagoras, but this is not because the older philosophers had not intelligence or penetration enough to raise themselves to it by the path of speculation at least with the aid of a thoroughly reasonable hypothesis. What could have been easier, what more natural, than the thought, which of itself occurs to every one, to assume, instead of several causes of the world, instead of an indeterminate degree of perfection, a single rational cause, having all perfection? But the evils in the world seem to them to be much too serious objections, to allow them to feel themselves justified in such a hypothesis. They showed intelligence and penetration, then, in this very point, that they did not allow themselves to adopt it, 
but on the contrary looked about, amongst natural causes, to see if they could not find in them the qualities and power required for a first being. But when this acute people had advanced so far in their investigations of nature as to treat even moral questions philosophically, on which other nations had never done anything but talk, then first they found a new and practical want, which did not fail to give definiteness to their conception of the first being, and in this the speculative reason played the part of spectator, or at best had the merit of embellishing a conception that had not grown on its own ground, and of applying a series of confirmations from the study of nature now brought forward for the first time, not indeed to strengthen the authority of this conception, which was already established, but rather to make a show with a supposed discovery of theoretical reason. From these remarks, the reader of the Critique of Pure Speculative Reason will be thoroughly convinced how highly necessary that laborious deduction of the categories was, and how fruitful for theology and morals. For if, on the one hand, we place them in pure understanding, it is by this deduction alone that we can be prevented from regarding them, with Plato, as innate, and founding on them extravagant pretensions to theories of the supersensible, to which we can see no end, and by which we should make theology a magic lantern of chimeras. On the other hand, if we regard them as acquired, this deduction saves us from restricting, with Epicurus, all and every use of them, even for practical purposes, to the objects and motives of the senses. But now that the critique has shown by that deduction, first, that they are not of empirical origin, but have their seat and source a priori, in the pure understanding, secondly, that as they refer to objects in general independently of the intuition of them, hence, although they cannot effect theoretical knowledge, except in application to empirical objects, yet when applied to an object given by pure practical reason, they enable us to conceive the supersensible definitely, only so far, however, as it is defined by such predicates as are necessarily connected with the pure practical purpose given a priori, and with its possibility. The speculative restriction of pure reason, and its practical extension, bring it into that relation of equality, in which reason in general can be employed suitably to its end, and this example proves better than any other, that the path to wisdom, if it is to be made sure, and not to be impassable or misleading, must with us men inevitably pass through science. But it is not till this is complete, that we can be convinced, that it leads to this goal. End of section 16 Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on October 12, 2008, in San Diego, California.